So hello and welcome to this webinar on the emergence of social eating initiatives and their value in reducing um, food poverty and promoting social inclusion. This is part of the Go Down Food Poverty webinar series and we're delighted to have with us Marsha Smith who has done extensive work on social eating in the context of um, food insecurity. She's going to talk to us about the value of commensality and the specific cultural issues that are related to food security in the UK. Now, Marsha is, she has many hats. She's a research fellow with Coventry University, um, with whom she did the majority of this research. She's also a visiting fellow with Nottingham Trent University in the UK, an advisor to Food Hall Sheffield, and a member of Nottingham City Council's Carbon Neutral Steering Group. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Marsha Smith. Uh, um and I'm a researcher looking at social eating, uh, particularly social eating initiatives in the East Midlands region of the UK. Um, and I don't know about all of you, but I am really missing eating out with other people. I don't know where you're all uh, beaming in from and the sort of lockdown conditions where you are, but we haven't been able to go out to eat together for the best part of a year. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to being able to do that again. Uh, and my research concerns some very deep and important needs that we have to eat together at the same table and in groups, uh, which is known as commensality in academic parlance. And my research looks at new practices of eating together. So I'm gonna talk um, about the research that I'm doing and the findings. Uh, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit at the end about the pandemic responses and how that's affected social eating. So social eating initiatives are an increasingly popular way of providing low cost meals for the public in the UK. These organisations provide a limited menu of meals prepared using food surpluses, which is the food that supermarkets can't sell. And they serve meals commonly to improve social inclusion. And basically, you can turn up to one of these social eating uh, initiatives, you can see in the photos, and sit and have a freshly cooked dinner for just a couple of pounds. And they might be described as sort of hybrid spaces, uh, which feel like a mix between a homemade dinner and eating out at a restaurant. They have elements of all of those things. And in Nottingham, where my specific study is focused, we've got about 15 to 20 social eating initiatives that attract a wide variety of diners from across the city. Uh, throughout the presentation, you're going to see illustrations and photographs that have been developed during my fieldwork. And these images come from both myself and the research participants. And you'll see that we're creating this rich portrait of the practices of social eating. So first, I'm going to talk about uh, the problems that my research is responding to. Uh, the methods that I investigate through uh, and by focusing on three different uh, practices of social eating we're going to learn about what participants value about social eating initiatives and how this links back to the problems that I'm going to identify in the UK society at the moment that we have been eating together uh, and particularly this is of hopefully of interest to Godan uh, members because this is putting eating together in groups uh, beyond its nutritional context back into a social context so I'm a sociologist uh, and that's my sort of interest in how society is constructed, reproduced and transformed. Uh, so I'm looking at social eating initiatives through that perspective. So one of the problems that we're having that we know about through GoDan as well is that there's food insecurity in the UK. Um, and we've got um, a rise in food banking, uh, a huge rise in food banking, actually particularly during the pandemic. Um, and this has a huge impact upon the way that people can uh, participate in social life. So for those suffering from food insecurity, the capacity to reciprocate and meal share around food is really diminished and amplified, excluding them from a vital part of social life. And even for those people that have got no issue in accessing the market of food, goods and services, many of them report eating alone regularly. So this is an enormous issue. So food insecurity, as we see it, uh, tends to be about the access, availability, affordability and appropriateness of food. But actually, what we also consider people's capacity to eat together as well, because it has such an impact on um, health and well-being and actually on a broader society. So food insecurity and food banks are increasing. and We've got record numbers of people having problems around um, accessing not just good food and eating well, but eating together. And eating together is fundamentally reciprocal. So those that can't afford to eat well can't afford to eat together. So think about after work meal times or birthdays or celebrations or swapping, you know, going for food around someone's house and they've been able to reciprocate. When you're food insecure and access to food is a huge issue, 
you're economically food insecure. It also means in lots of ways that you're socially food insecure as well. Uh, and actually, this means that in the UK at the moment, there are many people that are excluded from contributing to a, a shared social life because they are because they're experiencing food insecurity in this broadest sense. Um, another issue we're having in the UK at the moment, as you would know, is, is industrial levels of food wastage. So whilst we've got rising levels of food insecurity, we also have huge volumes of food that are perfectly good to eat that are being thrown away in the UK. And within the context of increasing environmental concerns about food waste occurring alongside in the rise, sorry, occurring alongside the rise in individuals that are struggling to feed themselves, it might seem that sort of putting these two things together, hunger and wasted food together would be uh, beneficial because it seems to link two needs together. However, much of the academic literature and much of the framing of surplus currently frames it as waste. And actually that's stigmatizing because people don't want to eat waste. And as one academic says, uh, food charity and surplus foods are giving leftover food for left behind people. Um, but what we've actually done through investigating uh, social eating initiatives and their use of surplus is realize that actually participants and users of surplus see surplus very differently and in lots of ways over the last sort of 10 years in the UK the surplus redistribution network including charities like Fair Share has massively evolved in its infrastructure and most of the food that uh, recipient groups receive is perfectly good quality even though it can vary sometimes in what you get uh, sometimes that food is actually fresher than you'd get in the supermarket because it never makes it to the supermarket so again, reframing waste food is something that people don't want to eat, but understanding surplus from its social value uh, can be more of an enticing offer. Um, and when we examine what surplus actually is and how it's used in social eating initiatives through the eyes of participants, as I said, this different picture emerges of a perfectly good food resource, which is enabling new forms of food sharing and commensality. And we can see that food surpluses are actually about much more than food. Uh, they're also about how they enable social connection. Another issue, it seems very negative, we have a number of problems in the UK at the moment, is the destructuration of the mealtime. Um, so again, we, for nutritionists out there, we've got a rise in the consumption of ready meals. In, your, um, in the UK, we've got the highest consumption of ready meals in Europe, and, the, and fast foods and convenience foods form a common part of the UK foodscape now. Um, however, in the UK, Commensality is undergoing a bit of a transformation because these range of new initiatives are emerging, which are dedicated to creating new shared eating practices. So again, we tend to think of ready meals as stuff that's maybe eaten alone, it's microwaved, it's maybe not great in terms of nutrition. Um, but actually there's quite a lot of evidence to show that some of these strategies that people are using or culinary strategies that people are using, such as heating meals and microwaves or, or using ready meal stuff, is actually they're trying to uh, strategize and able to, for them to eat together with other people. So being able to heat a meal in a microwave later on means that you might be able to sit and eat with somebody that's just come off shift. So actually, as much as we see that there is a destructuration of the meal time, and it's argued in the literature whether that's really happening or not, there was also evidence that some of the strategies that we associate with like fast food and ready meals and convenience food are actually people's attempts to still eat together uh, in a busy world where we struggle to match schedules. Um, and this rise in social eating initiatives that use surplus, you know, have been described as a, a form of food uh, aid um, and against sort of rising levels of food insecurity and a growing resistance to food waste. Um, but yet there's, there's not much evidence, um, especially empirical work, looking specifically at social eating initiatives. So there's a lot of stuff on food banks and on social supermarkets and a, a little bit of work on community cafes. But social eating initiatives are a bit different because they're not open all the time. They just have a couple of things on the menu. They use surplus and it is a paid for meal service, albeit a cheap one. So my research is looking at um, commensality and looking specifically at social eating. Um, and I'm really interested in the value that participants themselves place upon the social eating meal time uh, and the moments of commensality that they're creating. Uh, and basically, I used a number of different uh, methods. I'm a qualitative uh, sociological researcher. Um, I engaged about 150 participants using three methods that I'm going to talk about now. The first of those is meal centered focus groups, which, if I'm honest, is like my favourite bit of the research. Sitting and eating a delicious cheat meal with loads of other people is my idea of heaven. 
Um, what we did, we took along our post-it notes and we turned up, I think it's like six to eight different social eating spaces during a meal time and sat and ate with other people and asked them, why do you come here? Like, why do you value this service? Why is it important to you? And they wrote down, you know, hundreds and hundreds of insights on post-it notes, which we then put on a board. And then we had discussions where we started to arrange them into themes. So we started to do some of that formative coding in situ to start to try to understand why people value social initiatives. So that's meal centered focus groups. And that gives us like the narrative dimension of the value of social eating initiatives. And the next one I used was photo voice. So participants, stakeholders uh, and people that run the social eating initiatives were given the opportunity to um, take photos of the way that they were eating. And so again, this gives us the visual dimension of that qualitative data set. So again, receiving the food, sorting it, storing it, taking this temperature, setting up the spaces, how you put the tables, the dining rooms, the kitchen, people taking the money. So again, all of these things were captured uh, through photo voice. Uh, and the third uh, qualitative method I use as go along interviewing, which is like mobile interviews. So I turned up at the social eating spaces and they sort of walked me through the door, showed me how the space was set up, how the kitchen was set up. Um, like you see here, volunteers waiting at the hatch to take the food out. Uh, on the left of the picture, you'll see here um, a table with extra surfaces that were given as a sort of pay what you want, sort of almost like a little grocery store. And so the the go along interviews, people showed me their freezers, their cookers, how they actually physically serve the meals out and set up their dining spaces and how they arrange those things. And that gave us the spatial dimension. So what happens is that we built up this very rich picture of what happens in a social eating initiative mealtime, both the, the setup, the service and the clear down. Um, and I'm going to break now um, and just I think we're going to stop just for questions. If anybody's got any questions now and then in the second half of the presentation, I'm going to talk about the findings from the research. Excellent. Thank you, Marsha. If anyone has any questions for Marsha, if you could just place them in the chat or the question and answer function um, and we'll get to those either now or when we break for questions a little bit later on. Um, so I'm wondering, Marsha, you talked about the destructuration of the meal time, um, which is something I think is really prevalent here in the UK. And you did mention that um, it is particularly of all countries in Europe um, more prevalent in the UK. And I'm wondering why you think that this particularly occurs in the UK. I think in the, in the UK we've got a number of um, sort of coexisting issues is that people are working uh, shifts and working different types of hours. We've had what's called sort of culinary plurality where people want to eat the food that they want to eat. So again, this idea that, you know, somebody, usually a woman, would cook that food at home and people would finish work and they would all be there to sit and eat it and it would just be one meal that everybody eats, has sort of like fragmented slightly. So working patterns, women maybe not working so much from home, although actually the evidence shows that they're still doing the vast majority of the domestic labor. Um, people wanting to eat different things and having sort of allergies and different types of food preferences and also the vast array of types of food that are out there now. So when I was younger, like takeaways weren't really available. I'm like 45 now. It wasn't really something that was really around very much and eating out of restaurants was something really quite special. But now we have a huge array of like uh, foods that can be delivered, foods that can be frozen, can be microwaved. Um, and again, so when we go to the supermarket, there's a vast array of choice which has meant that what we call culinary plurality is that there's almost been an individualizing process that's happened around food. And also we had the rise of things like snacks. So again, there's like different patterns of eating, which also make, um, but there's evidence to show that the meal time is fragmenting. And there's actually also evidence to just show that it's not fragmenting, it's just being rearranged in different ways. Um, but what the evidence shows across the board is that despite whether you think destructuration is happening or not, eating together in groups is still perceived to be incredibly important, regardless of whether people are able to accomplish it or not. So commensality itself is still seen as really important. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, we've got a very interesting question from Uchechi, who works um, actually on these issues, among others, um, in Nigeria. Um, and she's asking what motivated the choice of the three research methods that you mentioned? Um, and also what do you think, which research method do you think is the best for this type of research? 
Well, I think actually they all go well together. Um, I'm interested, as I'll show in a little bit, in practices in the social world. Um, I'm looking at the level of, of practice and we know that practices are made up from sort of material resources, symbols, narratives and discourses and um, performances and roles. So I was looking for all of those things and I've chosen those three methods. One, because I really wanted to not massively interrupt the conviviality of the social eating initiative. I wanted to sort of capture the social eating initiative as it actually happens. So rather than pulling people away as individuals to give individual interviews, I wanted to actually work with the group dynamic and the convivial atmosphere in situ to sort of capture what was going on at that particular time. Um, and again, there's a, an array of different ways that you could have um, could have tackled this. But to me, I wanted to sort of, uh, I wanted to go and eat with other people. I wanted to actually participate. And I wanted to capture that sort of rich group atmosphere. Um, so which is why I've sort of used those three interviews because also what they do is that they, they give the participants a voice very clearly and allow them to sort of convey what is important to them. So three things like photo voice or go along interviews. Um, and also it captures not only just the actual mealtime eating of food, almost like the consumption moment, it captures it in that sort of broader social contact, uh, context, but it is, it's a manageable empirical research project. Sorry, just one second, I'd muted myself. Um, so from Rebecca O'Connell at UCL, um, Rebecca is saying really valuable sociological approach to understanding food poverty, absolutely, and examining, and examining excuse me, social eating. Um, she's asking, did you collect data about the characteristics of the people attending, um, for example, universal or targeted, and hence particularly stigmatizing? Yeah. No, I didn't. And so, as we know, with any of us who are doing PhDs, it's a, it's a very narrow and deep focus. Uh, and what I wanted to work on was the actual immediacy of the meal. So going along, social eating spaces aren't, are, they're not, they don't have eligibility criteria. Anyone can go along for a meal. And actually, they need a broad range of paying customers or, because eating, everybody eating a meal for £2.50, but there's a hundred of you. I guess that's what makes these initiatives work. Um, and so I didn't want to find out necessarily anything about all the people that were eating, more about the value of why, what they thought the spaces were about. There is a whole load of data that could be collected here around the different demographics that are actually accessing and also the people that are not attending social eating initiatives. But I say, for example, understanding on like a class based level would it would mean that I'd have to explain it would have to come to an agreement with the participants about what class was which class group, for example, they were felt that they uh, belonged to and the sort of implications of that. To me, that would have taken me away from the immediacy of the meal. So, and also the issue around commensality is commensality is, is in every culture and across time, it's a commonality. And what I was interested in was looking at what unites people as opposed to what maybe divides them and polarizes them again. And also I wanted to capture that rich sort of convivial eating experience because I thought that that was something that seemed to me very significant and it wasn't like a food bank, it was like a celebratory, pleasurable sharing atmosphere. And actually asking people about what their demographic was might have sort of almost stigmatized them before we'd even got to sit and eat in the meal. So I wanted to ask them what, what they valued about the space rather than, rather than like who they were and why they were coming. But again, you know, that's a limitation of the study and it's certainly something that um, we could class-based analyses, race-based analyses, gender-based analyses, all of these things could certainly um, enrich the sort of emergent body of knowledge about social eating initiatives. Fantastic, thank you very much. Great um, question, so I, I know it's going to come up in my viva, so yeah. <laughs> so I think we can carry on now and if anybody has any questions that they would like answered, anything um, that Marsha brings up that you'd like more information on, then please put the questions in either the chat function or the question and answer function, and we'll get to those in a little bit. Thank you, Marsha. Okay, let me resume. Okay, let me. Uh, can you see that again now? Yeah? Yes. Great, okay. So I'm going to talk about the second half of the presentation is really looking at um, 
are both about what I find out and why it's important, the implications of that, hopefully the implications for some of the people that are, are, are listening now. So I'm really interested in, in practices, in theories of practice, um, because I see practices as a, as a sort of midpoint between the powerful determinants of, of social structures, which are somehow a bit more intangible and definitely difficult to sort of empirically investigate. And then also this the midpoint between the sort of overly individual behavioural approaches, which when we know that behaviour is massively shaped by social structures, um, I don't want to just look at behaviour, I don't want to just look at individual behaviour, I want to look at group things, because this seems to me to be a group eating experience. Um, so I'm interested in, in social practices, um, and I'm looking at set up, clear down service of social eating meal times. So it's something that's empirically encounterable, um, but we can see the effects of drivers of social structures, again, like food insecurity, food poverty, food wastage, but we can also see sort of agency um, as it's expressed in the way that people like set up spaces, why they use them and how they value them. Uh, and what I did is I displaying my research findings as montages. So trying to show the variety of people, roles, resources, symbols, materials that go into a social eating mealtime. And I'm going to sort of show you three of them and the three practices that are, you know, the findings of my PhD. And these montages aren't completed because I haven't finished them, but I'm just going to show you them now to give you a, a sense of how I'm making sense of the data that I've collected. So first of all, uh, first finding the reason why people value social eating initiatives is that they're restructuring commensality. So I've just said that whether it's happening or not, people still see commensality is really, really important and something that they want to accomplish, regardless of how difficult that might be. Um, and so in this montage, I've got the, the various ways that I've coded the data up at the top, and then I've got the photo voice, and then I've got the, uh, the quotes from participants from the post-it notes at the bottom right hand side. And as one participant says, sometimes it feels like the only time we had family meal all week. And so social eating initiatives are valuable because they are rebuilding opportunities for people to eat together and to create moments of commensality. So even if it's just once a week and you go along to your social eating space, it's a couple of hours a week that you could just sit and eat with other people. So we have people eating here with, with friends, with new friends, with family members. Um, again, the way that the tables are arranged, for example, the, the photos show here, get people to eat together. The fact that it is um, just a, a one or two hour window, so it's just a meal time, it's not open all day. The fact that it's only maybe one or two things on the menu, so people are eating from the same pot, which works with surplus, it works as a, a scaled meal, but it also means everybody's eating the same thing. So somebody's not having lobster while the other one's having baked beans, everybody's having the same dinner pretty much, which again helps to build group cohesion. And what we also see around this sort of restructuration of, of commensality is it's enabling people to develop food capital, food socio-cultural capital, food socialization, food literacy. So it's enabling them to sit and eat with other people, table manners, uh, volunteering, helping to wash plates, clearing down the space afterwards, like you would at home, you would, you would help out. Um, it also means that people are getting to try foods uh, cheaply that they wouldn't go to a restaurant and necessarily feel comfortable about ordering or even go to a restaurant at all. It allows people to actually go out and eat together and go out, which is something that's really important, but it's very cheap and it's often very local. So again, the stuff around uh, informal learning settings. So again, rather than have a cooking class, people that go regularly to social eating initiatives report trying new foods for the first time, diversifying their diet, um, getting children to eat at the table, and maybe the fact that you haven't had to cook it all, um, there's less pressure, which means that kids are happy to eat and try different things, but also it's very cheap. So if you just want to just try something, you can do that. So it increases food capital and food socialization and food literacy. Uh, the second finding is about aliment con contribution. So as I've said earlier on, one of the issues around food insecurity is it's, it's about alimentary exclusion. So when people can't afford to eat well, they often can't afford to eat together. And it means that they're missing out on this really important part of social life, this sort of social engine that commensality is. Uh, and again, as I've shown here in the montage, we've got the codes from the top around um, helping out um, or alimentary comp uh, contribution. So people, for example, in the top uh, right of the photo, there's somebody taking money at the till, so taking payments. In the mid photos, we've got people rearranging tables and putting them together because at that social eating space, it was very busy. 
and there weren't enough tables. So customers themselves saw that people needed to be seated and they went and actually got the tables and chairs and put them. And then some of them pushed them together so a bigger group could eat together. So what you're seeing is people have an opportunity to contribute. They have an opportunity, they have agency, they have an opportunity to get involved. Um, and then at the bottom here, you see people volunteering at the hatch to take food at that particular social eating space. They were served at the table, which for, again, a lot of people, it was really nice to serve somebody dinner, just as it was really nice for some of the groups to actually sit and have table service, particularly elders. So again, elementary contribution. And as someone said here, everybody participates at some level and gets something out of it. So just for a couple of hours a week, you know, people that might want to set it up, it takes longer, prepare the food, it takes longer. But for a lot of people, they can come along, have a cheap meal, they pay something, again, rather than being a, a sort of more passive recipient of welfare, um, they get to contribute. And again, that is seen as a really important form of practice. And the third finding um, is to do with performances of care. So we know that cooking and eating and food sharing as part of common sanity is really, really important. So Robin Dunbar from University of Oxford, who's a really famous uh, evolutionary biologist, said that eating together in groups is basically one of the most important things that humans do. And it has bigger um, impacts, not only on individual health and well-being, but on group cohesion. And that people that eat together regularly report having a, you know, a greater sense of, of happiness and well-being and also having a purpose in life. So when we think about the way that gendered roles or um, you know, hierarchies, performances of care are about much more than um, just feeding people. It's about, it's about feeding the social realm um, and feeding those social structures like the family. So one of our participants described social eating space as a, a safe and welcoming place with food at the heart, which I thought was a really nice description of the stuff that was going on there. So again, we can see from the photos here, big groups of people eating together. And I don't know about you all listening, but I, I love eating with lots of other people. And I love being in big, busy dining rooms. As my, my late father called these places, people places, where they're sort of informal places where you could just turn up, there's no energy reach criteria, pay a couple of quid and sit and eat with a great meal that's been freshly made with other people. So we see performances of care, socialising, um, meeting up with people, feeling loved, feeling cared for, things like getting a three course meal made for you feels very domestic. Um, the food is evidently homemade, often it's served to you or you can go and help yourself. So again, it has all of these elements that cross over from the domestic sphere and from sort of eating out commensality. And so it's a hybrid space. So again, if you put these three practices together, you sort of start to see that within social eating initiatives, there's all of these practices that are sort of amalgamating and creating um, a sort of an experience of value for members. So coming to the end now, um, we'll talk about the value of social eating initiatives. So, um, and by the way, the photos are often taken either by myself or by participants. And some of the illustrations you've seen here are by Louis Paul from um, the Food Hall Social Eating Project in Sheffield. Again, so we've worked together to to co-create some images as well for the thesis. Um, so basically, uh, social eating initiatives are acting against this destructuring structuring tendencies because they're helping to restore commensality. They're giving all sorts of people opportunities to sit and share food together in its most simple sense. And this again frames participants not as passive recipients of, of waste food or of free benefits, but actually as active elementary contributors, whether it's paying a small amount at the till, whether it's helping out, whether it's joining in in conversation, whether it's getting the tables and chairs and putting them together, people have an opportunity to contribute. And then again, as I said in the previous slide, this enables care beyond kinship, it's building social cohesion. But again, it's really important to not just think about the nutrition and the instrumental meal, but it's social context and how that can also add value. And in lots of ways, particularly in Nottingham and the broader East Midlands region, where we're seeing the sort of rise of social eating initiatives, it's a form of public um, and social infrastructure. So we know, for example, like libraries are about much more than borrowing a book. They're place and space based uh, social infrastructure. And we might see social eating initiatives in the same way. 
And what this position in terms of my research is also about critiquing this sort of top down approach that a lot of public health has been engaged in. And a lot of the narratives that we have around sort of responsabilizing individuals in society, saying that if you just budgeted more or if you just like learned how to cook better with lentils or if you just grew more vegetables on your like windowsill or you started to snap sourdough, you know, starter, made your own bread, which all of these things are noble and they're worthy and they're important parts of our foodscape. But for a lot of people that are under stress and in poverty and under pressure, it's just a whole lot of other things that, that we're expecting them to do. And we don't criticise middle class people for going to Waitrose, which is a sort of upmarket supermarket in the UK and purchasing a ready meal. But we do berate poor people for eating ready meals. And actually what we want to understand is that when we reframe this as a civic opportunity for people to eat together, to eat well and to eat cheaply, um, we start to see that pleasure, sharing, socialising are much bigger sort of a pull towards rather than trying to have this reduction, restriction and restraint narrative, which in lots of ways is, is stigmatising and it's not an attractive value proposition. If we want to proliferate social eating and its benefits, we need to think about how we reframe it as something that you or I would want to do and places where you and I would want to go for meals, not just something that happens to other people and particularly poor people. Um, and again, I, my research is situated within this and contributing to this more than food approach to saying that at social eating spaces, there's much more going on than just food. Uh, and just briefly talking about the lens of commerciality, my sort of contextual approach, really commerciality is an engine of society. And it's, there is so much more that happens around the dining table than just the consumption of food. So again, this works well with understanding social eating initiatives beyond this sort of socio-economic critique or a behavioural critique. There's something in the middle here around commensality. And again, reframing uh, the consumption of surplus as like a, an opportunity to build civic life. And I've already talked about um, food, uh, socio-cultural capital, and also understanding these organisations as anchor organisations. So again, they are networked into their local communities in really intelligent and sensitive ways. And they're able to deliver sort of soft services beyond food. So again, seeing these organisations as not just like places where charity is dispersed, the organisations, organisations themselves are offering much more than food. And I guess this it gives us in some ways like a broader conception of food insecurity, because it asks us to think about food, not just in its instrumental, nutritional, physical sustenance, but in its social um, value as well. And I've, again, I've talked about the rebuilding of social infrastructure. So the very last slide, I'm just going to talk briefly about what happened to social eating in the UK when the pandemic hit. So, of course, you know, lockdown in the UK meant that social eating stopped. So people couldn't go to shared dining rooms and sit and have a meal with each other. So what happened? So on the right hand side here, you'll see WhatsApp um, message where basically I messaged all of the social eating groups that I was in contact with the network and said, look, what are we going to be doing about sharing food? Are you going to, what are you going to be doing? And that basically set up an enormous dialogue that went on for months and months that I helped to moderate, which basically showed that even though um, we couldn't eat together in groups, the groups switched very quickly to meal delivery rather than social eating. So they were still in contact with their customers. They were still offering that social support and a meal. And that they were really important anchor organisations that they already had experience in using surplus food. They were already compliant and had safeguarding procedures. They already knew around risk assessment and sort of food compliancy stuff. And crucially, they were that human interface between the broader issues with food security that the UK experienced at the beginning of pandemic and the face to face delivery of that to, to real people. And what the City Council did is on the right hand side of the photo was involved in helping to set up a food triage system. So the city council had a central line that you could ring if you needed food support that then triaged out to the local ward um, officers. And then it cascaded down to the specific social eating food bank and food provisioning groups that were active in each one of those geographical areas. And in that way, we kept, yeah, we basically, you know, gave what I would think was a really good service in the city. You know, there was a huge amount of, of support for that. And I think we did really, really well to make sure that in Nottingham, there's a huge issue with food poverty, um, but we did really, really well to make sure that people didn't go hungry. Um, so I helped coordinate that WhatsApp group and, and helped to sort of set up that food triage system. 
And just at the very beginning of lockdown, and this is only social eating groups, they did over 50,000 meals uh, and about 15,000 food parcels, just at, just the social eating groups on that initial three months. And even now, a year over a year later, they're still doing about, 50, about 1,500 or about 1,500 meals uh, they're going out to deliver. And what it looks like is that they will have a hybrid service as we come out of lockdown, is that they will still deliver meals to people that are either unconfident about coming out into social spaces or are still shielding. And then they will have a mix of people sitting and eating together in groups. Um, so I'd sort of termed this as in lots of ways that, that they were enabling eating together, even though we were apart. So they still, and the values of commensality basically still underpinned that service. So even though people could eat together physically, in some ways they were still involved in like an eating together community uh, and again so i still think social eating initiatives were really valuable and also they delivered huge amounts of food and meals across the city during the pandemic so they really showed that they were incredibly valuable sort of during pandemic time however as we know you know a lot of these groups they're, they're precarious they're reliant on volunteers they're subject to funding cuts you know there's there's um scarce resources like food um like community centres and, and, and kitchens where they can do their work. So again, this isn't just a rosy picture in terms of everything's perfect. There's a lot of issues um, that make it difficult for people to eat together in groups and make it difficult for and challenging for people to run social eating initiatives. But I'm hoping that my research shows the value of them beyond this sort of waste food for poor people narrative. Um, yeah, and so this is, I know that further research is applied, but this is just sort of a bit of my PhD. And I just sort of wanted to publicly say it's been absolutely fantastic working with these groups over the last couple of years. And it's been really humbling just the amount of work that they've put in to make sure that their communities are fed um, and just how successful this model has been sort of in, in, in good times and bad. Um, and uh, that hopefully these networks are going to proliferate. So I hope that that's useful. Um, if you've got any more questions, I've put some resources here that I'm happy to share the slides. Uh, that talks about social eating in in uh, in Denmark, in France, in Brazil, in Poland, just some other sort of uh, global uh, examples of where we have sort of social eating type um, networks. So hopefully that's useful. And um, if you've got any questions, please, I'm happy to answer and I'm happy for you to contact me. My Twitter is um, eating on purpose. So if you sort of if you look me up on Twitter on eating on purpose, you know, I'm happy to have dialogues and stuff like that on there as well. So thank you. Thank you very much, Marsha. And if I could just um, remind our audience, if you would like any questions answered by Marsha, um, then could you please pop them in the chat and in the question and answer function? Thank you. Um, there is a question here from Julia Brannan um, from UCL who is asking whether there's any variation between social eating initiatives and what key conditions from your research do you think that these social eating initiatives need to meet? Sorry, could you just ask that again? Because I literally just cut out the second that that question came through. Sorry. Absolutely. Um, is there any variation from your research um, that you've seen between the different social eating initiatives and what key conditions would you say these initiatives need to meet? So the key initiatives that they, the key things that need to meet is that they they take food from a, a national charity called Fair Share, so they have to be compliant with like health and safety regulations. So they have to get registered with that charity. You know, you need a, a kitchen set up and a community space. So that's some of the basic stuff that you have to have, and you have to team of volunteers. So there are some sort of basic practical criteria that groups have, but also all the social eating initiatives in the network of the Nottingham Social Eating Network agree to be open access so they don't have eligibility criteria so the, the, the sort of overarching purpose of that network is to promote sort of opportunities for people from all sorts of people to just sit and share food together um, and is there variation yes there is variation so some groups and again this is why I'm looking at it from the perspective of practices because what it does is it digs into the specificities of each location but also looks at some of the things that link them so some groups have, um, and again, why I'm looking at the sort of spatial stuff as well as the sort of narrative stuff is that some groups serve from a hatch. Some group can't have people queuing. They don't have a space that so they have to serve them at the, the table. Um, some groups just pop up in a space. Some cafes are more embedded in places and they, they might run other stuff, but then run a social eating space for a couple of um, hours per week. 
There's ethnic variation. So we get again, depending on the groups that run the groups, you'll, you'll see different types of menu. It's not a homogenous menu. And also it changes according to what the food has got, um, what food they receive from Fair Share, for example. Some groups have things like um, they have a local allotment that then feeds into their food supply. Some of them are very targeted towards, you know, like reducing food waste. And that's like a big part of the way that they publicize themselves. Some of them are to do like maybe more enticing elders and uh, stuff around isolation. And they might have other stuff like a friendship club or game things that sort of like wrap around those meal services. So, yeah, there is a variation. And this is what the, the, my research shows. Um, and again, when we look at some of those practices, we can see the variation. But there's also a sort of commonality around all of them, which is basically around, you know, using this model, using surplus, being open for a limited time having a limited menu, making it affordable and getting people to eat together. Thank you. From your research um, and talking to the participants in these services, then what would you say or what would they say really were the biggest benefits to them? Yeah, so I think the three practices and that have really come from the participants' data, which is basically... Um, socialising, meeting new people, having a hangout, physical hangout space where they can actually meet people and sit and eat food. Things like, again, it's a whole variety of stuff, like not having to think about what they were going to make to eat, not having to do the washing up, you know, those sorts of things, not having to do the cooking. And again, so rather than stigmatising people, sort of say, well, you should be cooking everything from scratch and you should be cooking everything fresh. Social eating initiatives give people the opportunity to eat a homemade meal and have the benefits of that homemade meal nutritionally and socially but actually don't but but very very cheaply but without any of the hassle in some ways and also it's a way of also going and eating out for lots of people can't afford to go and eat out especially if they've got children um, or they don't want to do it or they don't want to go to the pub but they want to maybe have something to eat so i think there's there's lots of different benefits but i think they they come underneath this umbrella of sort of more than food and those three practices of you know um restructuring commensality, elementary contribution and performances of care. That's the three main findings and the three sort of the biggest sort of uh, practices that I could identify from my data set. Thank you very much. Um, how did the home delivery and food collection system that you talked about, how did that work and how did the various groups work together? Well, it worked by sheer graft, to be quite honest. It's, it's, in a bit of an emergency situation, I'm actually doing some, I'm involved in some other research with Coventry University looking at what enabled and constrained community food groups and fair share to deliver food services during the pandemic. And again, a lot of it was that groups were already used to using surpluses. They were already used to cooking at scale. They were already risk assessed, although they had to learn new risk assessments and run new risk assessments during the pandemic, with like spacing people and, and dealing with volunteers and PPE and that sort of stuff. But a lot of them already had some of those structures in place. And so the idea that the UK government could just sort of drop money onto the problem and that money would solve it, which great money enabled groups to, to purchase more food and some equipment and some other stuff. But actually it relied upon people's pre-existing groups, pre-existing knowledge and networks to work effectively because setting up a, a meal delivery service it's not just about making the food, it's actually about how it how it's actually delivered and where you know that people are that need the food. So those existing social networks came in very useful and um, lots of word of mouth referrals into those groups. But things like they worked with local taxi firms, so the groups made the food and then taxi deliveries would pick up the food and have a Google map route that they would go around, like Deliveroo, and they would go and deliver those foods. So again, when we see look from the perspective of practices, we see practices and elements of practice has been borrowed over from like, you know, the, the sort of fast food or the ready meal industry, as well as new practices of risk assessment, for example, and new practices of like caring. So it was an enormous amount of work for people. And I think this is really important for the research that we're, that we're doing at Coventry at the moment is to, is to visibilize a lot of this work that's been invisible because it's happened behind closed doors we've been locked down and often it's happened so fast as well that then we've moved on to other stuff so again it's really important to sort of almost try to capture um some of that stuff in a bit of a time capsule because you know it's a really important time in in, in the uk so yeah that's how people did it was basically by borrowing sort of practices and processes from other areas of, lo of, of life 
and amalgamating into these hybrid services. But really, it was also just a huge amount of work uh, for people. Thank you, Marsha. Um, there is another question from Lopa Sakena, who you may have bumped into. Um, she does research around food insecurity at Coventry University. Um, she's saying, great presentation. Absolutely. Um, just a question. You mentioned homemade meals in these social eating places. Does it mean food? And any insight from your work? from your research from a public health perspective. Could you just repeat the first part of that question? So does it mean food what, sorry? Because you said it mean homemade food. Um, so does it mean that the food is not cooked on site because you mentioned right. homemade meals. Yeah, okay. In the social eating places, does it mean yeah. food is not cooked on site? No, food is cooked on site. And I use the terms of homemade meals to talk about the fact that it's it's people in kitchens actually making the food and you can see that it's made fresh it's not it's not a factory or a machine process so for example you can tell the way that it's put on the plate and when you go to the hatch you can say well, actually i don't want gravy on it or i don't want all the carrots or i want this so again it's like you can ask for sort of a little bit of what you want often you can go out for second helpings which is a bit like eating at home as well and the fact that i you know that it's really only one or two meals it's not like you can choose from a huge menu an extensive menu like you would if you were eating out so yes, I, I use the term homemade, but also to show that those commensal practices that we see in the domestic sphere, some of the elements of those practices are being transferred into and are visible within social eating initiatives. Just as you see some of the, the practices and processes of eating out, for example, like paying for a meal or actually going out physically out of the house to go and eat somewhere else. Um, so that's why, again, I use that sort of practice, theories of practice approach. And the implications for public health are really that, that a lot of the time we problematize people for not cooking for themselves and going in and, and maybe eating convenience food without recognizing that for a lot of people, having somebody make them a meal, even if it's like a delivery delivering it, if somebody cooking you dinner and there was a huge social and, and care value that's embedded in those practices. And instead of punishing people or sort of like, you know, like having a negative narrative about sort of say like dependency on a service um, and that they ought to be so maybe cooking more from scratch, which all of those things are fantastic. But for a lot of people that are vulnerable, it's just another thing that they have to do and often maybe maybe not so good at. And a lot of the public health messaging has been like, say, like 30 minute meals. But there's a load of research to show that it doesn't take people 30 minutes. It takes them an hour. And what it does is it switches people off from cooking for themselves. So instead of problematizing people and sort of saying it's even more things that the individual needs to learn how to do alongside like breastfeeding and smoking cessation and healthy food and, and all the other things that you have to sort of become an expert in. It's really nice to go somewhere and have somebody cook you dinner. And we shouldn't be problematizing that. We should be recognizing that that's a real human need and it's a driver. And so instead of actually sort of saying what you need to do is, is you know, is do less things, you still say actually, what we want is loyal customers to go to social eating spaces to sustain them. And we're throwing all of this food away and it actually needs to be eaten. So one of the things we could be doing is saying, actually tonight, you don't have to worry about the cooking. You don't have to worry about what's gonna be on the menu. You don't have to worry about all these things. You could just go somewhere and somebody will make you dinner. And there's nothing wrong with that. We actually want your custom. So I think for public health perspectives and the stuff that I'm working at in, in the city and council level in Nottinghamshire, is around basically thinking through those messages and recognizing that there's actually nothing wrong with looking after people. Um, and actually we ought to be doing that because it's, again, it's about much more than food. It's about building social cohesion. Um, and the people that are probably most vulnerable could really be the ones that could do with the biggest break. Um, so again, social eating also enables lots of wraparound stuff. So if you want to do cooking lessons and you want to do nutrition uh, and you want to do sort of local grown or other stuff, it starts by engaging people and having a three course meal is a reason for people to come and it's a reason for them to stay. So if you wanted to maybe stack on other stuff, social eating initiatives are a really good way of engaging people initially and then maybe signposting them to some of these other things. And also there's lots of people that are switched off by formal learning. They maybe didn't have positive experiences at school. And so again, informal learning around food socialization of food literacy, just seeing people eating different things, trying new foods, seeing people cooking and the types of equipment that they use. There's lots of different ways that people can learn around about food. 
And so social eating initiatives enable that sort of broader, softer approach. Thank you. Um, you talked about what was going on during the pandemic um, and you gave us some really good insights into that. What are the plans now that the lockdown is now lifting in the UK? What are your plans going forward? So the, talking to the groups, what it seems that they're going to be doing is they're probably going to run a hybrid service. So some groups are raring to go and they're actually some of them are already starting to do social eating, but just distance social eating. Um, again, as the lockdown sort of restrictions ease and people can eat together in groups, there's going to be loads of issues with people's mental health, a lot of unemployment, and there's going to be lots of stuff around well-being where people have just been isolated for a long time. So I think some groups are, are going to be focusing more on engaging existing customers and sort of welcoming them, welcoming them back out into public places in ways that feel safe for them. There are a whole load of other groups that have just engaged a whole other audience during the pandemic of people that never uh, it didn't really know that the community food sector existed and didn't know the social eating existed. So I think some of the groups are going to be trying to sort of uh, maintain and sort of strengthen those um, relationships with new customers. And a lot of them are going to be going and doing a mix of meal delivery, food parcels and social eating. So I think we're going to see like a, a hybrid services and then there are some other groups that are looking at uh, centralized uh, kitchens where some of these meals are going to be made en masse so that um, spaces where there's only just a cooker and there isn't maybe a huge team of volunteers or they can't get access to the space all the time they might still be offering like a heat and eat service so a proliferation of social eating into places that it couldn't go to before so there's been quite a lot of innovation I think that's already happened uh, in the networks but also I think fundamentally what's happened is those social eating networks really really showed their value during the pandemic because they were a basically like a food welfare safety net for big swathes of the city and so I think that that ongoing investment in those networks I think that their value has been shown really evidently and so hopefully some of those networks will have better investment into them. And I think that in Nottingham City, we're certainly in Nottingham County, that's definitely happening. And we're starting to see social eating is now being written into the local resilience fund uh, plans. So I think that, uh, and also hopefully after many of us have been basically at home or locked away for a year or months on end, hopefully we're going to see a renaissance in social space and people are going to want to come back out and actually sit and with each other so hopefully we're going to see a sort of um yeah a revaluing of social connections and and, and social relationships uh, and hopefully that will benefit those networks wonderful thank you very much and thank you for coming and sharing your research um with us today um and I think you really helped us to understand the issues surrounding sort of food security, social eating, in inclusion, um, and also that cultural aspect as well. Um, because, of course, the UK is um, very different to other countries that Godan has worked in before. Um, so that's been really, really interesting for us. Thank you very, very much, Marcia. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you to our audience as well for joining us today. Yeah, um, thanks and for the we questions. Will, <laughs> we will be back with more webinars um, soon. So if you would like to any more information on this topic, then you can contact me on Catherine.bailey at godan.info. Um, I'll just put that in the chat function and we'll be following up with every body who has attended this webinar today and who signed up for this webinar um, with follow-up and how you can access more information about Marsha's work. So please don't hesitate to contact me if you want any more information. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you.